holy name. Amen. Not to call anybody out or anything, but um, there is a white RAV4 in the parking lot whose lights have been on since the beginning of the service, I was told to announce. So we all want to watch you get up. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we do want you to be able to get home today, too. So. Gallup News came out with an article this past Monday entitled, Americans' Mental Health Ratings Sink to a New Low. That probably doesn't surprise you, does it? It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise anyone with the kind of year this has been. Now, to be clear, if you were to read the report, I read through it today, read through it this morning. The study is not one that comes from mental health professionals. The study from Gallup is merely a reflection of asking people how they personally feel about their mental health right now. So it's how they're feeling about how things are going right now and their mental health and whether they're struggling or not. According to the report, each year since 2001, Gallup has asked Americans as a part of its November health and health care survey to say whether their own mental or emotional well-being is excellent, good, only fair, or poor. The reading for those rating their mental health as excellent or good ranged from 81% to 89% until this year's 76%. Although the majority of U.S. adults continue to rate their mental health as excellent, that's 34%, or good, 42%, and far fewer say it is only fair, 18%, or poor, 5%, the latest excellent ratings are eight points lower than Gallup has measured in any prior year. Again, who's surprised by that? No one. What's fascinating is to look at who is feeling worse and who is feeling better about their mental health right now. To quote the, the article, the drop in Americans' positive appraisal of their mental and emotional well-being varies across demographic, demographic subgroups. The following group's ratings of their mental health as excellent fell by double digits since 2019. Women, Republicans, Independents, and those who attend religious services less than weekly. White adults, those who are unmarried, older adults, and lower income Americans. Democrats, and frequent church attendees show the least change in their mental health ratings. We're not here to discuss why. We're just noting that it's there, and that's what they're finding. Listen further. The subgroups showing the greatest declines in excellent mental health are not necessarily the groups with the lowest positive ratings. That is, more Republicans and independents than Democrats say their mental health is excellent, while women rate theirs less positively than men. In addition to women and Democrats, lower income Americans, young adults, the unmarried, and those who seldom or never attend religious services have the lowest excellent ratings. And these demographic patterns have been most, mostly consistent over the past 20 years. Now, relevant to our passage this morning is, I'm not going to comment on most of those things, just so you know. Even though you want me to, I'm not going to do it. I'll leave that to the rest of you to do that on Facebook, which you, you happily do. 
relevant to our passage this morning is that very interesting comment and that very interesting statement that those who seldom or never attend religious services have the lowest excellent ratings and that has been true for 20 years that they have been taking this report. Our passage this morning is all about going to church. Not just verse 25. All of it is. All of it is about being here on the Lord's day. I know that we focus on verse 25 when we read this passage and say, that's what says we need to be here, and it does, but so does the rest of the passage. It's all related to being at church. Now, in general, when we look at these verses, verses 19 to 25, it comprises the first set of responses to what we've been studying since chapter 4, and that is the high priestly work of Christ. So in verses 19 to 25, we're going to see an exhortation to those who generally come and gather and they're affirming Christ. What should they do with each other and how should they meet together as they're trying to continue on in the things of Christ? Then you're going to get down to verse 26 to 31, and that is a warning to all of those who are on the fringe and leaving Christ. So there's two major paragraphs of responses to what we've been studying about the high priestly work of Christ. This morning, we're going to focus on the exhortation. How should we respond to the high priestly work of Christ, especially those who are pursuing the Lord? They're faithful to the Lord, but there's always the temptation to weigh on the soul. What should we do so that we we don't lose anybody? You need to be in church. Don't just go. Here is what a faithful fellowship should look like when we do come together. In other words, the faithfulness of Christ's high priestly work requires very faithful responses from us. That's what we're seeing here. What would a faithful response to the high priestly work of Christ look like? If we were to say, looking at the high priestly work of Christ, this is the right way to respond to that, what would it look like? That's what verses 19 to 25 answer. There are two faithful responses to Christ's high priestly work that are highlighted here. Two, in general, that we're going to look at And hopefully we can do that carefully and mindfully, thoughtfully about what that looks like here with us, what needs to change, what needs to strengthen, what needs to deepen. But two, faithful responses to Christ's faithful high priestly work. What's the first one? I I simply call it confident convictions. If you want to respond faithfully to what Christ has done as the high priest, and again, we have been looking at that in great detail for months. How do you respond? With an absolute confident conviction. That's verses 19 to 21. In essence, verses 19 to 21 are summary statements of everything that we have been studying since chapter 4 and verse 14. It was chapter 3, verse 1, that introduced us to this idea and this call to Jesus, who is the high priest of our confession. Chapter 4, verse 14, the writer of Hebrews began detailing what it actually means to consider the high priestly nature of Jesus' work. That's what he's been doing from chapter 4, verse 14, all the way through chapter 10 thus far, Here's what we've been doing. We've been carefully considering what the high priestly work of Christ actually consists of. We're thinking about it. What is interesting, and I'll let you do that some more on your own, is to go back to chapter 4, verse 14 through verse 16 and compare that with what you're reading here in verses 19 to 25, and you'll see a great similarity of language. In chapter 4, verse 14, It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, chapter 10, verse 21 says, since we have a great great high priest over the house of God, chapter 4, verse 14 says, let us hold fast our confession. Chapter 10, verse 23 says, let 
us hold fast the confession. Chapter 4, verse 16 says, let us draw near with confidence. Chapter 10, verse 19, since we have confidence. And chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near. There's a great similarity between the two. They're bookends. This is the summary. This is the capstone to what we began all the way back in chapter 4. So everything in chapters 5 through chapter 10, verse 18, was written for us to consider, to think about how Jesus is the great high priest of our confession. We saw how he had the right lineage to be that high priest. That was chapters 5, 6, and 7. He comes in the line of Melchizedek. We considered how his service as a priest in heaven was far greater than the service that Aaron had and his sons in the Old Testament tabernacle. That was chapters 8, 9, and 10. So Jesus is the truest high priest because he comes from the heavenly line connected to the heavenly priest Melchizedek. And he's the truest high priest because he's the heavenly high priest connected to the heavenly work in God's very saving presence. And let's just admit something that the writer of Hebrews admits as well. This isn't all easy stuff to think about. It's not. And for some people, it's not the most stimulating kinds of things to think about. He actually acknowledges that. Do you remember that little statement back in chapter 5 and verse 11? When he said, concerning him, and that was Melchizedek, we have a lot to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. You know what that means? He's writing this letter to a group of people who are under siege, under siege by the culture, under siege by persecution, and they become so preoccupied with what was going on around them, they could care less about Melchizedek. And yet, you know what would keep you in the faith? You know what would really keep you strong and holding on to your confession is to think very carefully and continually about who Jesus is and why his high priestly work is effective. Then you won't leave him. But if you get focused on everything around you, if you get focused on your circumstances and yourself and your life and you're preoccupied with all that's going wrong, guess who you're not thinking about? Guess what you're not thinking about? It's highly relative to think about it. That was the warning in chapter 6. If we get bored with dwelling on Christ, we'll leave him behind. We'll demonstrate that we're not genuine followers of Christ because we'll leave him behind. Doesn't seem relevant to us. Just want to remind you, the key, my friends, to avoiding apostasy, and I want you to think of this personally. The key for you avoiding apostasy, which means turning away from Christ, is to keep on considering Jesus as your high priest. He has said that over and over and over. So now he comes back to write the capstone of that, and he's going to provide another exhortation. And in wrapping up this whole section on Jesus as our high priest, he tells us again, think about, consider Jesus who is the high priest of our confession. Think about it. Dwell on it. Have this as a very confident conviction. Notice the way he begins that in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, we have confidence, and we do have that confidence We've been thinking about it. We have confidence. That's a very important word. It's a present tense verb in the Greek New Testament. Present tense meaning not that it's happening right now, but present tense means what? We've talked about this before. When the Greek language uses the present tense, it means something that's going on all the time. Make it your habit to continually consider Christ and to continually have this kind of confidence. The word confidence that's used here is an important word in the book of Hebrews itself. It's used a number of times. The root word behind this word confidence is actually the word freedom. Freedom. It's a way of thinking that has no barriers. You know what that's like. Well, maybe you know what that's like. I remember getting on 
Interstate 20 in Texas. Anybody know where Interstate 20 is in Texas? Yeah, hardly anybody does. It's in the middle of nowhere. And it's just one long stretch of highway, and it's fairly straight, and the speed limit is 80 miles per hour. Remember that, Kelly? She's like, open it up. Because it's straight. And listen, she loves to go fast, too. I just want you to know that. It's not just the husband here. <laughs> On that long road, remember it well, you've got freedom. You've got freedom. It's 80 miles an hour, so you go whatever. <laughs> That's kind of the idea behind this word freedom. There's no barriers. There's no concerns. There's no... No bumps in the road, it's just straight, it's wide open, and you can just let it, let it ride. And since we have, because of what we know about Christ, this great confident freedom, because there's no barriers in our thinking to our access to God, because of what he's done. You've got confidence, complete freedom of thinking in terms of your relationship to God. That's what he said back in chapter 4, verse 14. We have a great high priest. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us draw near with confidence, a free way of thinking. He says it again in chapter 10, verse 19. Since we have confidence. And look down at verse 35, chapter 10. What does he say there? Do not throw away your confidence. Oh, you have it. It's a reality. Christ has given you direct access to God. You have complete freedom. There's no hindrance there. Come to him. Draw near to him. Think about him all of the time. But you better hold on to that confidence. Don't throw it away. So if you wanted to sum up everything that we've been saying about the work of Jesus as the high priest so that we could have continual confidence, I'd sum it up into two different convictions that you should have. This is how you respond to the high priestly work of Christ. We won't dwell on them too long, but just to name them here. First, let's just rehearse it. This is what you need to have complete confidence about. Complete freedom of thinking in regard. So this keeps you in Christ. First, Jesus is our only entrance to God. He's the only entryway to God. There's not another entryway. There's not another path. There's not another road. There's not another way to get acceptably to God. There's just one way, and he's the only way. And if you've studied through these chapters as we have, it's very clear as to why. His high priestly work is the highway to God, and it's the only way to get there acceptably. And he says that in verse 19 very, very clearly. Since we have confidence to enter... And enter where? The holy place. Temple language again. The holy place by the blood of Jesus. He goes back to this language of temple, but not an earthly temple, the heavenly temple. He's not focused on the earthly tabernacle anymore because it's our great high priest, chapter 4, verse 14 says, that has passed through the heavens. Chapter 8, verse 1, he had taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens, a ministry in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. Chapter 9, verse 11, Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Chapter 9, verse 24, he did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's in heaven. He is the only entryway to God acceptably, and he did that by means of the instrument he used to give us access to God is his own blood. And we've looked at that so many times, and what is his blood referring to? His sacrifice, his death. That death gave you entryway into God acceptably. It paid for your sinfulness so that God could wrap himself around you as his own. It's an amazing thought. It's his blood. Not our death, not the death of an animal, his blood. Look at verse 20. 
his blood opened up a new and living way. A new and living way. The word new is a very rare word in the Greek New Testament. It's not found very, very often. In fact, only here in the book of Hebrews, long before its common use in the day that the writer was use, using it, it was used to describe an animal that was freshly slain, an animal that was freshly killed, not in a sacrificial sense. So don't think sacrifice here, just the body still warm, that idea. Like a friend of mine who was showing a picture this week of a deer freshly slain, caught in a fence, still warm. What do you do with it? You pack it in your, in your van and take it home and use it for dinner. That's what you do, right? It's new. It's fresh. The body's still warm. That's the idea. That's Christ. This is not old, like the old covenant, stale, passed away. This is new, fresh, but it's not newly dead. It's a new and what way? Living way. His death, his blood was necessary, but he's not dead. This is, a po- this is pointing us to, again, the resurrection. Christ is alive. What, what is he doing? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's constantly interceding for us to keep us in him. It's a beautiful thing. And he inaugurated this for us. This is such a picturesque view here. How did he inaugurate or begin this or open this up to us, this new and living way? Through the veil, again, temple language. You remember the Old Testament temple between the holy place where many of the priests could operate and the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. There was in that earthly temple a veil. Now, what did the veil do in the Old Covenant? It kept certain priests out, didn't it? But it was not just a barrier, And it didn't keep everyone out. The veil was also an entryway, wasn't it? Yes, because that's how a priest, the high priest, would actually enter in to the saving presence of God, the room that represented the saving presence of God. He would go behind the veil. Now, we remember in the description that was given to us already in the book of Hebrews, the heavenly temple never had a veil. It was one open room. It never had a veil. Meaning there wasn't anything keeping people out other than their own sin. Christ then becomes the veil. His flesh, his death becomes a place to keep certain folks out, but a doorway to let certain ones in to have faith in Christ, to trust his death on your behalf, to trust that he satisfied God for you in his death is an entryway into the saving presence of God. Not to acknowledge him as savior, not to see his death as satisfying God, not to respond in faith to that is a barrier that keeps you out of the saving presence of God. His veil, his flesh, his humanity that was satisfying to God, that he gave up his life in that perfect humanity to satisfy what God demanded for you as a substitute for you is the entryway. It's the entryway. It's a beautiful picture. You need to think about that over and over and over again. He's the only way to gain entrance to God. Think about it. He is your entry to God. If you have Christ, you have God. With his arms open wide to receive you and welcome you when you're doubting whether you're accepted by God or not. You ever had those thoughts? I don't know. I don't know if I'm in Christ or not. I can't figure it out. I'm I'm not sure. That's a weight on my shoulders. And and let me tell you, if, if you've never had those doubts, I wonder if you've really thought about it. Most everybody's had those doubts. Some people have them over and over and over. But let me ask you the question, who are you normally thinking about when you have those doubts? You're thinking about yourself. And what are you thinking about yourself? Oh, positive things, right? 
really, really encouraging things. No, you're thinking about your sin. You're thinking about what you don't do. You're thinking about what you didn't have. What you're, all these issues are clouding your mind. But we're called to consider Jesus. He's the author of faith. He's the high priest that gives you entrance to God. If you think about yourself long enough, you'll never have confidence. There's no freedom of thinking there. If you think about Christ, there's constant freedom of thinking. There's no barriers there because he's overcome every barrier to God. He's the only entrance to God. Think on it. That's a confident conviction. That's a response you need to have to the high priestly work of Christ. Let me give you a second response or a second conviction within these responses, and that is Jesus is our only mediator between God and before God. He's our only mediator before God. That's verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, we have confidence because we don't just have a new and living way to give us entrance. We have a great high priest who's over the house of God. He's exercising his position over everyone who belongs to him. He's protecting them. He's sustaining them. He's interceding for them. He's a great priest over the house of God. What is the house of God? Well, it is that temple language again. The house of God is the temple, right? But we're not talking about the earthly temple, the earthly tabernacle. We're talking about the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly house of God, that's God's dwelling place, the place from which he dispenses and governs over salvation. But it's not merely a place. It's a people. It's a people. Just jot down in your notes, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, just as a reminder, maybe jot it out to the side by that phrase, house of God, because it's a reminder. It says Christ was Faithful as a son over his house. And then it says this, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence. That's pretty fascinating. We are that house. We are the house of God. Who's we? The church, the congregation. We are the house of God, and Jesus is over that house. Literally, the, the preposition is upon. He's upon that house as if he's, he's on it, sitting over it, governing it. It's like if you come to my house, you gain entry when I let you in, when I welcome you in. It's my home. I open the door, and I let you in. You say, what if one of your kids does that? They'll get in trouble unless I tell them they can Right? Whoever's over the house has a right to offer entry into the house. That's who our priest is, the one who's governing the house. And we are that house. The church is his. If you keep that in your mind, if that is what you are considering about Jesus, if that is what you're thinking about in terms of why God will accept you, you will have confidence in your relationship to God. But if you continually dwell on yourself, your circumstances, your surroundings, our government, whether they have authority over us or not, other people's thoughts about you, what they value, what they think about you, all those kinds of thoughts sap confidence. You'll shrink back. You will keep yourself from God's people. You won't be a part of his house because you're more fixated on you individually. There's no spiritual confidence in that, is there? Not at all. But if you want to avoid apostasy, if you want to avoid walking away from Christ, if you spiritually want to thrive in this world until Christ returns, you have to have confident convictions regarding Christ and his high priestly work. And I just want to remind you one more time, You can be confident of that today sitting in this room. And if you think that's the pill that just solves it for me, I'll never have doubts again, you're wrong. This is why you have to think about it again and again and again. This is why you pray about this. This is why you read about it continually. It's why you talk about it with each other. 
to reinforce it. It's why we sing about it together. You ever think about that when we come together? Uh, I, I know it's very popular today to think about singing as my private experience time with God. But congregational singing was never intended for that purpose. Congregational, not that purpose alone. I, I hope you do commune with the Lord through that. But it is our confessing to God and to in one another what we believe about the work of Christ to encourage us in our convictions and what is true. And when we sing it, we're expressing a jubilation in that. We're, experience, we're experiencing or at least calling our hearts again to rejoice in it. We pray over those things together as a church. We talk about them in the sermon We respond to them afterwards. We talk about it with each other because you have to maintain those convictions because if you're convicted of something else other than the high priestly work of Christ in your relationship to God, you will leave him. You'll walk away. You have to have confident convictions. Let's talk about a second faithful response to Christ's high priestly work that we find in verses 22 to 25. It comes out of those convictions, flows from them, and it leads to a second response to the work of Christ as our high priest. It's confident actions. Confident actions. If you really believe it in your mind, it should work its way out into your behavior, right? That's not hard to understand. It's not hard to grasp. But what are those actions? It's not difficult for, the, for us to see them here. There are three of them. Each one of them is begun with the little phrase, let us. Do you see that? Verse 22, let us draw near. That's one action. 23, let us hold fast. The third one, verse 24, let us consider. Now, this is monumentally important. A lot of what we have been talking about throughout our study of Jesus and his high priestly work has been focused upon the impact that he is having on us, should have on us personally, individually. And rightfully so. Rightfully so. In the context of this book, there are individuals who appear to be on the verge of leaving Christ for something else in light of the pressure not to identify with him. But the solution... For overcoming apostasy is not only individual in its solution. It's not just an individual solution. It's a congregational solution. The actions called for, the actions that call for the congregation to act together are clear here. Let us do this. Let us do it. Now, it's true, the author may simply be saying to the whole group, each individual should do these things. But think about this carefully. All of these individual responses are not given here absent of the congregation, but in the idea of the congregation being present. All of these are individual actions. Yes, no one can draw near. No one in this room can draw near to God for you. But we should all draw near together. It's not a new concept in this book. He's been saying this the entire time. I want to point it out to you. Just jot these down. We do these actions together. Jot down chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, plural, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider. The word consider in the Greek New Testament, it's a plural. All of you consider together Jesus. Do you remember chapter 3, verse 12? Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you all. The you is plural. It's the Texan all y'all. Remember that? So all y'all. Who's he talking to? A congregation. Be careful that there's not any one of all of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another. Who's he talking about? People in the church. 
the congregation. Encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today. Why? So that none of you all will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you, plural, all of you, may seem to have come short of it. Chapter 4, verse 14. Let us hold fast our confession. Chapter 4, verse 16. Let us draw near with confidence so that we may receive. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let us press on to maturity. Chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. We desire that each one of you, plural, each individual among the congregation, so that you, plural, will not be sluggish. We don't want any of you to be sluggish. Every individual call is a congregational call as well. Never forget that. Apostasy from Christ is born through isolating yourself from Christian fellowship. Think about that. Apostasy from Christ is born from isolating yourself from Christian fellowship. I know how busy we are. It can be blinding at times. I know how challenging it is to fit it all in. I know we all have different individual tastes about what we share, what we don't, what we like doing on our own or what we like doing together. But you better think about this again. Apostasy is born out of isolating yourself from Christian fellowship. You do that, there's no way you're going to maintain confidence in Christ. So what are the actions, the congregational actions that really are good reflections and responses to the high priestly work of Christ? Let me give you these three. First, we approach God confidently. We approach God confidently. That's verse 22. Let us draw near, he says, with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near. Present tense in the Greek, constantly draw near. Let us together continually come near to God. Let me just tell you again what this means. This phrase, let us draw near, is the fundamental definition of what it means to be a Christian. This is who a Christian is. A Christian is someone who has access, acceptable saving access to God, who can come near. That's what it means to be a Christian. That, that was not the case within the picture of the Old Testament system, was it? Where was it that God demonstrated his approving presence? It was in the tabernacle. It was in the temple. And where was the temple and the tabernacle located? Right in the middle of all of the tribes of Israel so that God was in the midst of his people. But one day a year, one man could draw near to God actually and he did it on behalf of other people. He did it on behalf of the nation. He had blood on his hands that covered his sin. He had blood on his hands that would cover the sins of the people. And one day a year, they could have confidence, freedom of thinking that their sins had been covered so that they could actually draw near to God. But they had to do it through another man. But as we've been seeing over and over again, Christ did that right? In the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple for you, for us. So what does that mean? No man, no woman, no individual goes to God for you anymore. He's already done that. What does that mean then? You draw near to God. But it means more than that. It means we draw near to God. We do. And this is no small thing. 
It's no small thing to come in close relationship to God as his own son or daughter, acceptably, forgiven, and freely. Now, now what, what would it look like to draw near to God in an acceptable way? How would you know you're doing that? Well, he, he describes it here. You do it with a sincere heart, right? A sincere heart. Well, what does that mean, a sincere heart? Does it, does it mean you just convince yourself that you're okay? I'll just believe hard enough that I'm okay, and so that'll get me in. If I believe it sincerely, I, I, I'll get in okay. No, that's not what this means. Sincere is actually the word in the Greek language that's often translated as true. Draw near with a true heart, a genuine heart. Yes, sincere is appropriate there, but it's a heart that's marked by truth. It's spiritually genuine. It's spiritually true, so it comes in truth to God, genuinely. This is language that takes us back to what we've studied in the New Covenant. He wrote his law upon their hearts, so truth was on the heart so that they could freely come near to God. You draw near with a heart that has been made true and genuine, and you do so in full assurance of faith. Now, this is where the rub is, isn't it? Full assurance. What is assurance? Assurance is the experience you have when you believe something truly. That's what assurance is. It's an experience you have when you believe something confidently. If I believe something very confidently, I have assurance. If I'm not quite sure about what I'm believing in, guess what I don't feel? Assured. This is where many people get in trouble. I don't feel the assurance, so I must not be secure. Literally, this should probably be read. It's the full assurance that comes from faith. This is important. Faith produces assurance. Faith is the confidence that you have in Jesus. So the more you're thinking on those convictions we talked about, the more you're thinking on them, dwelling on them, you're sure of them, there's a freedom of thought in them, you have confidence, and then you feel assured. You're dwelling on yourself, you don't feel assured. You dwell on Christ, you feel assured. Assurance, full assurance, is where your confidence is completely fixed on Christ and not yourself. You say, yeah, I get that, but how do I know he's done that? How do I know I'm actually in him? Well, the text tells you. We draw near with a true heart, a heart that's saturated with the truth of God in complete assurance that comes from our faith because we have already been and remain having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies have and continually to be, continue to be washed with pure water. I want you to think about those phrases just very quickly. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our hearts, the inner man, it's been sprinkled clean. Who sprinkled it clean? Did you do that? No, this was done to you. This is objective. It's not based on how you feel. It's not based on what you think. It's based on what is actually done. Who did that? God did that. God sprinkled your heart clean. He did that through the work of Christ. When you trust Christ completely to save you from your sin, you are experiencing then, you receive then, your heart's being sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And remember, the conscience is simply the activity of the heart. It's what the conscience is. It's the activity of the heart. If the heart has been made clean, the conscience then is clean. It's freed from evil. It's freed from the evil that marks unbelief. No, you've, you've believed in Christ, therefore you have been. It's a perfect passive in the Greek meaning that it has happened, you've been cleansed, and you remain cleansed, and nothing changes the cleansing. It keeps on going. You didn't do that. God did that. That's why you have faith. Not because you attain it, because you accomplish that. God did that in your heart, and that gives you assurance. And your bodies are washed. Again, this is all kind of Old Testament language, and you think about the priests who had to be 
cleansed first before they could go into the presence of God. That's now you, but it's perpetual. The body's washed. The priest would have to go through all kinds of cleansings before they could go in. That's you. Your body has been washed with pure water. What's the image that we, as Christians, take on to ourself to display that inner work of God in our heart? Baptism, isn't it? It's the perfect image of being cleansed and made pure and showing that we have access to God. It's what baptism is, both inside and outside, both the inner man and the outer life have been made clean before God. That's a fact. That's objective. You can't erase that. And that gives you faith, which breeds assurance and calls you then to draw near. But can I also remind you, this is what we do not only individually, but together. Do you understand what we are doing right now in this very moment is we are drawing near to God? When we walked into this place together and we all stood to our feet and we opened the Bible and we began to listen to God's word call us together out of Psalm 2, you know what we were doing? We were drawing near congregationally. What was happening when we were singing? So, oh, I was just singing these Christmas songs that I love to sing at this time of year. It's kind of a tradition of mine. No. We're confessing truth t- together. That's why some of these Christmas songs that we sang today have some of the richest theological language in them. They're reminding us of who Christ is and what he has done and what was accomplished through him. And we're saying it to each other as well as to God. We're drawing near together to God. What are we doing when we're hearing the word taught and proclaimed to us? We're drawing near to God. We're hearing him plead with us and say, think these things and get rid of that sin and come near. And we're doing it all together, coming near to God. This is temple language. This is language of the church. You do know that the church in this age is what God views as his temple, where he dwells in his saving presence, in us as a congregation, right now. I'm always reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you, plural again, that all y'all, you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you He's dwelling in us, not just in you and your personal physical body. That's not what 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about, in us. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. The priests came to the temple to draw near to God. Who are we? We are the temple. We're coming near to him. We inhabit his saving presence. The first action, you draw near to God. You do that as a church. You come to church. That's how you draw near to God together. There's another action that we see here, found in verse 23. You don't just draw near with confidence. You hold on to Christ faithfully. Hold on to Christ faithfully. You see verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What does that mean, hold fast? You you know what that means. It means what's in your mind every time Edwards Hilaire gets the ball. Hold on. Not like Ezekiel Elliott, unfortunately, with the Cowboys who doesn't know that term. You hold on like a mountain climber on a cliff, you hold on. Like my mother holding on to that armrest when I was learning to drive, you hold on for dear life. Like victory rides on it, you hold on tighter and tighter. 
That's the idea. Hold on and keep holding on and don't quit holding on. Hold on tighter. What do you hold on to? The confession of our hope. What's a confession? A confession, you know what a confession is. You ever signed one? No, I'm not asking if you've gone to jail or anything like that, but uh, maybe you have. What's a confession? You're saying, they put a confession in front of you if you're a criminal and you're signing that. You're saying, this is true of me. I agree to this. This is true of me. This defines me. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to stand on. This is what I could be judged on. Our confession is what we believe, isn't it? It's what we confess together as a people, the confession of, But here, it's not just the confession of our Bibles, it's the confession of our hope. The word hope, almost always in the New Testament, is pointing to something future that is connected to the return of Jesus Christ. Virtually every time the word hope is used, it's pointing us to the second coming of Christ. It is a confession that finds its fullest expression and ultimate expression in the return of Christ. You hold on to what you believe about Christ because you know that it's coming and he's coming to make all things new and you're going to be found in that. It defines you. It's who you are. You hold on to that belief. Essentially, everything that we've been talking about about the person of Christ since chapter 4 is our confession about him. And you hold on to that until that priest comes and brings you to himself. You hold on. Don't give up. And you do it without wavering the word actually means with no angle no tip there's no tipping here no downward angle it's unbending no wavering how do you do that i don't feel very faithful i know that as soon as i walk out of this place i'm going to be assaulted by all kinds of issues in life and i don't feel that way well you don't hold on to your confession of hope because you're faithful Why do you do it? What's the last phrase of that verse? For he is faithful. (laughs) He's faithful. You hold on because he holds on to you. Isn't that an amazing thought? You hold on because you trust that he's never going to let you go. You hold on. You do it without wavering. The person that made all those promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fulfilling all of those through human history, bringing it all to the culmination of the person of Christ, you hold on to that God. You know why we've been studying the book of Genesis in the summers? So that we could not only hear the promises of God, but so that we could recount the whole history of how God, despite the unfaithfulness of his people, is faithful to his promises. That impacts us now. He's faithful. We hold on to what we believe. We do that in our individual lives when we're studying the word and we're praying and we're meeting for fellowship with others. We do that together as well, though, don't we? We confess together. On Sunday evenings, we've been actually hearing our statement of faith, reminding ourselves of what we actually confess we believe the Bible says to remind ourselves this is what we believe. It's what we do when we sing. We're confessing truth. This is the confession we're hoping in, we're trusting in, we have confidence in. It's what we do when we hear the word, we're studying it and letting it get into our minds and into our souls so that our confidence is unwavering. We hold on. You hold on and you do it together. Let's look at the last action. You approach God confidently, you hold on to confession, your confession confidently and faithfully. Third, encourage each other, encourage each other continually. Encourage each other continually. This is such rich language. In fact, this is really so significant, so vital that I'm going to actually spend the first few weeks of the new year unpacking what this looks like even further. Let us consider, you see it? Let us consider, let's think about, let's constantly give careful consideration to how we will stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Consider, that's again an important word, 
Pay attention to it. Think about it. To think. It, the root word of it is to think, but it's intensified by a preposition that means to think intensely about this. We were told in chapter 3, verse 1, think about Jesus, consider Jesus. And now here we are told, in light of who he is, in light of all the things we've been considering, now think about how to stimulate each other. Or as the older versions read, provoke one another. Now some of you think that, I've got that spiritual gift. Yep, I know how to provoke. I do that all the time. And it kind of has that, that meaning. It's only used twice in the New Testament. And one of them means to provoke in a negative sense. But here it, it means to stimulate, to energize. In other words, we're to think about how do we stir up the affections of the congregation? How do we energize the activity of the people of God? How do we engage in such a helpful way God's people so that they are willing to risk their lives, risk their health, risk their reputations, risk their relationships because the confession of our hope outweighs all of that. How will we do that? Think about it. Give careful consideration to it. How you're going to stimulate each other to love and good deeds. Now again, we're going to unpack more of that. The writer of Hebrews will unpack more of that to come. But love I think is a full-orbed love, love that is founded in your love for God that extends to others. An affection for God that spreads that affection for other people. How do we stimulate ourselves to start thinking about how we could commit ourselves in Godward love toward one another and good deeds, not just deeds that the world thinks are good, but deeds that the gospel calls good. You say, well, what is that going to look like specifically? That's just it. He doesn't tell us, does he? You say, well, I need a list. Give me a list of what that would look like. No. He wants you to come up with a list. You think about it in your time, in your era, where you are, in the places you are, with the people that you're around, in the unique circumstances around you. Keep thinking on, in light of who Jesus is, and in light of the pressures on us to quit... How do you stimulate each other and energize each other to love God and one another in actionable ways that display God? But I want to show you something here. How we stimulate one another to love and good deeds. How do we do it? Verse 25 says, how. How. And he starts with a negative. By not forsaking our own assembling together. <laughs> did you notice he did not say, choose to meet together? He did not say that. He said, you stimulate one another to love and good deeds by not forsaking. Why would he say it that way? Because, my friends, it is assumed that Christians will meet together. So that's why he would say to people who meet together, don't forsake the meeting, because that defines who you are. You do understand that. The very definition of the church, the word church, ecclesia in Greek, means a gathering. A gathering. So by definition, we are a people who meet. That defines us. How do you know where the church is? Who's meeting? Who's meeting? That's the church. So do not neglect the assembling of yourselves. Episunagoge. You hear a word, synagogue in that, which simply means a meeting, but an intensification on the first of that word, episunagoge, which means Meet together, get together. Don't neglect the get together. Don't do it. It's who you are. It defines who the church is. If you don't regularly gather with God's people, there's no reason to believe that you're one of God's people because that's who we are. The people of God who meet together. If you refuse to gather, at best, it is sin. At worst, it may mean that you're not one of his. You say, oh, but wait. These are unique times. They are. 
If you're see- sick, meet with us in two weeks. Get well. But don't let it be the definition of your life that you're not going to meet. <laughs> you can't do that. If, if you're somebody who's very susceptible perhaps right now, an older adult who has certain physical challenges, and in these days of what's going on right now, you may choose, you know, for this time period, I'm not, I'm not going to meet with the body, but that can't define you. It can't define you long term because we are a people who gather. I just want to remind you, gathering is not virtual. You may watch the Chiefs game at Arrowhead, but if you watch it, you're not gathered there. You'll be benefited. You'll enjoy it. You'll have some gain from that, sure, but it's, it's different than being there, isn't it? We know that. So I, I don't mean to heap any kind of unwise conviction on anyone. I don't want to guilt trip anyone into anything. But listen, this is who we are. And the longer this goes on, friends, we're going to have to give careful consideration to what's going on, spiritually speaking. We are a people who meet. That defines us. Don't forsake the getting together as has become the habit of some people. Why would they not be meeting? They're not sure they want to follow Christ anymore. So why would you assemble with that people if you're not a Christian? That's very telling as to who the church is and why we gather. Why we gather is not simply to attract the world. Why we gather is to display the body of Jesus Christ. And so if you, if you don't meet, then that's a sign you're probably not connected with Christ because Christ's people meet together, and they do that on the Lord's Day. But even more, if you don't meet together, guess what you won't do? You will not stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You won't. You can't. You can't do it corporately. <clears throat> you won't be stimulated by others. Interaction with others requires presence and involvement. To absent yourself from the gathering is to subject yourself to the battering ram of discouragement, despondency, self-dependence, self-focus, self-promotion. Because you're not availing yourself to the ministry of others. Sin always does this. Sin always leads people to isolate themselves. Isolation will lead you to despondency towards God's people and eventually the truthfulness of God's word and despondency will eventually give way to a despair that will lead you away from following Christ. You need to meet together because you have a confidence in who Jesus Christ is so that you will stimulate one another to love and good deeds It's not just the negative that he expresses here. He also says it in the positive, doesn't he? Encourage one another. Encourage one another. That word encourage means to come alongside in a personal way. Come alongside someone. And it could have the idea of console. And it can also have the idea, it could be the word exhort. Either one. It's the same word. You could come alongside to console when consolation is needed. You come alongside to exhort where that is needed. Where someone's weak, you don't pound them, you help them. Right? 1 Thessalonians 5.14, jot that down. If they're weak, you come along and you help them. If they're discouraged, you encourage. If they're unruly, then you admonish them. You assess the situation. But with everybody, you're patient in this. And you're constantly finding a way to encourage. And, And notice the intensity that's here. You do this All the more, even more, with greater and greater intensity as you see the day drawing near. What's the day? That's the return of our Lord. Why would he have to say that? It needs to get more and more intense, your encouragement, your exhortation as the day gets near. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. 2 Timothy 3. But realize this, that in the last days... Vicious times will come. 
For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Why do you have to do it all the more until the day comes? Because the days are getting difficult. They're going to get more difficult. That's the whole context of this book, by the way. The days are difficult. All those things that we just read, they've been true since the days of Christ, haven't they? What the Bible indicates is they will intensify. He says, does that mean that the gospel is not affected? Oh, it's effective. But in the providence of God, he preserves a people in the midst of an ever-growing viciousness in the culture. The entirety of the New Testament teaches that people will be converted. The church will not be defeated. We can have positive influence, yes, but the anti-Christian winds of the culture assailing the lives of God's people will grow. And that's why we meet, and that's why we won't forsake it, and that's why we encourage, because we're going to do that until the day comes to a completion and then it's all done. I mean, we read that in Psalm 2. Why are the nations in such an uproar? And when will that uproar end? When the sun returns and the nations bow. Well, there's a lot more that I want to say about that. That's why I'm going to take at least the first three Sundays of the year to do it. Next week, we'll try to turn our attention to the birth of Christ and some marvelous things there, but we're going to start the year out by talking about why do we gather? What is the gathering? What should take place in the gathering? What does the rest of the Bible say about it? And how can we start doing that even more faithfully now in the midst of this present season? I think it's a timely opportunity for us to encourage one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for time of meditation on the word. We thank you for this opportunity to think carefully about Christ, what we believe, and how we should respond. Lord, I know there are all kinds of of things that we need to think about in response to this, and, and we certainly want to do that and come alongside one another helpfully but I pray that it would be the conviction of our soul that we never isolate ourselves. That we draw near to you together. That we hold fast our confession, not in isolation from one, one another, but together with each other. And that we think about carefully how we can encourage each other, stimulate one another to love and good deeds by meeting together, by not forsaking our meeting by exhorting and coming alongside. Lord, let this flavor our lives. Let the world see in us a people who are careful in their consideration, loyal in our affections to Christ, unwavering in what we believe, constant in how we seek to help each other apply it. We pray for your grace to assist us now in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.